We've got folks around the table that represent the public sector, the private sector, uh, community organizations, teachers, educators. I see folks from all cross crosses of uh, uh, the system, uh, all parts of the system. Um, so as many of you know, the, the foundation, our foundation uh, has a mission statement to help Delaware create a system of public schools that is among the best in the world by 2020. So the challenge we figured is how do we do that? So we've been at this with uh, our partners in the public sector and the private sector for uh, since really 2005, 2006. Um, and that's a critical piece to this. I mean, we basically said that the work is going to happen at the De in the Delaware context, right? But we've also said we need to look at what's happening around the, around the US that we can learn from, but also what are the best performing systems in the world doing that we could learn from? And so as a, a part of that process, uh, I've been out to look at uh, Singapore and Shanghai and Finland and Canada, a number of different places. Um, and we've learned a ton from those visits. And um, as I shared with some folks earlier, the challenge with those visits is, well, you look at Finland and you say, well, you know, let's take that teacher preparation program, or you look at Singapore, and that's wonderful. It's, but it's, we're not looking to try and transplant those ideas per se. What we're trying to do is take the big ideas that have been generated in those places and bring them into the Delaware context. So what we did with the foundation is we said, um, let's engage a group of folks, and I'll go through who they are in a second, uh, some of the best minds from around the world, uh, to not only just give us input on a one-shot deal, but actually have an ongoing relationship with us so that we can iterate with them. Because this is a hard process. Nobody in the country is doing what we're doing right now in Delaware. Um, there are a lot of places that are, I've been out, I was in Alberta six weeks ago. Um, there's a number of individuals that are going out to see what's happening elsewhere, but nobody's building this ongoing relationship and dialogue. And part of what we're trying to do is marry that to a, a statewide dialogue around what makes sense for Delaware. So it's an exciting process. Um, you're going to hear from uh, a handful of folks today. I'm going to just give brief introductions and I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, Andrea Schleicher in a second. Um, but I'll just introduce him quickly. Um, so Andreas Schleicher, uh, he's going to be the first person to speak, um, is the uh, a lead person at the OECD, which is the group that has put together the PISA, which is the 15-year-old test. And he'll describe in much more detail about what that looks like. But is really looking at the 65 industrialized countries around the world and having conversations like this that are being sparked from uh, Mumbai to you know, Maryland, right? So these are conversations that have been stimulated by the work that he's going to share with us. Um, and by the way, he is probably the master PowerPoint presenter. So it's going to be an interesting, um, uh, interesting opp opportunity for you to see what uh, he's going to share with us. Um, but we're going to also have a brief presentation from him, um, about 20 minutes. Then we're going to actually open it up to a more of a, a dialogue. It's going to be three parts, um, where Joanne Weiss, who is uh, going to come up in, in a few minutes after uh, Andrea speaks, she was uh, the former chief of staff for Arne Duncan, um, and before that was in the private sector um, and engaged in education endeavors. Uh, she is going to help facilitate a, a kind of a Q&A with two respondents. Um, one is from Australia, Ben Jensen. Um, and he worked uh, previously at the Grattan Institute and um, is now leading a new venture uh, that is doing work primarily in Australia. But he has expertise in uh, the Southeast Asian uh, countries, as well as parts of the US. Um, and also Jim Dueck, who uh, helped design the accountability system in Canada, which we spent a lot of time looking at Edmonton. Edmonton is about the same size as the state of Delaware, a couple hundred schools. Um, if Edmonton were an independent country, uh, I'm not sure where it stands exactly today, but uh, over the years has been among the top in the world. Um, and they actually spend less than we do. So how do they do that? So um, he created an accountability system that sort of drove some performance that is really exceptional. And we've gone back and forth there to visit. So the first section is going to be uh, Andreas giving a big picture. The second part is going to be Joanne sort of having a Q&A with uh, Ben and Jim from Australia and Canada, respectively. And then there's going to be a broad conversation where you can just engage. And so part of the way we're thinking about that third part is that you have some index cards and pencils. And because we have a fair amount of people here, we thought, jot down your questions as you're going through. And we're going to have staff gather those, and we're going to be able to maybe synthesize questions that they're similar. We're just going to try and maximize the opportunity so that we can get as many questions answered as possible. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Andreas and um, welcome him. Thank you.
Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I've actually been really impressed by the level of progress that Delaware has seen over the last decade in raising education performance. It's a great example of an education system that actually shows the kind of dynamics that you need to see. But there's also a lot of potential for further growth when you compare with the most advanced education systems. Before I talk about uh, educational comparisons, I want to show you something else. One of the things that we did recently is not test children in school, but actually test adults in the workforce, the kind of numeracy and literacy skills they have. And then we looked at how those skills actually predict success in life you know, on many dimensions. And you can see, for example, this is the average in the industrialized world. If you're actually at the high end of the skill distribution, you're more twice as likely to be employed. You're more than three times as likely to earn a great wage. And these disparities have been growing year after year. The impact skills have on the life chances of people are growing. That's why it's so important to get it right. But it doesn't stop with money. You can see a relationship with health, with the propensity of people to volunteer. There's a sense of political efficacy. People at the high end of the skill distribution see themselves as actors in political processes. People at the low end see themselves as objects. And even trust. You know, you think there's something to do with how you grow up, with the families, and so on. True, but it actually we can predict a fair part from the skills of people. This is the average in the industrialized world. And in fact, when you look at the US, the bars look like that. There is no country in the world that is as good as the US in extracting value from the skills that people have, turning better skills into better jobs and better lives. And that shows you, you know, if the US would get its education system right, the labor market is as good as nobody else's. It could actually become the most productive uh, economy. That's why it's so important to get schooling right. And that's what I want to talk about now. PISA is our standard for actually measuring success. We have most of the industrialized world covered in that. Just very, very briefly what this is. We test about every three years about half a million students. And they take a test, and that's quite important, that tries to not only look at whether students have learned what they were taught, but the really looks at whether they can extrapolate from what they know and use and apply their knowledge creatively. And we do that because the world economy no longer pays you for what you know. No? Google knows everything. Yeah, the world economy pays you for what you can do with what you know, and that makes such an important difference. No? That's very, very different from the past. And uh, we then also collect data on context in which from which students come, the parents, the principals, the whole system to understand actually what drives success in education. So the first thing I think everybody has basically seen, you can look at basically how well do countries perform on that kind of measure. You can line up countries on a scale. In green, I put the countries with very strong performance, now based on the test scores students got. 15-year-olds in this case. Yellow is sort of so-so countries in the average range. And then red are the countries performing below the OECD average. And when you actually look from the top to the bottom, these are kids at age 15. There are about six years of schooling that separate those kids. There's enormous differences in the knowledge and skills that people have actually gained. When you look at the United States, it sort of comes out slightly below the average in mathematics, and I must say that's the most challenging part for US students. If you look at problem solving skills, they would, would do better, they would be in the green area. But let's focus on mathematics. There's also a lot of variability. You know? Unfortunately, you know, Delaware aspires to be one of the best performing education systems in the world, but has not yet data that is actually internationally comparable. But some of the states do actually. Massachusetts, for example, is doing really well by global standards. Connecticut is doing so-so. That's where you probably guess to have Delaware as well. And Florida is doing quite poorly. There's a lot of variability among the states. But all states you know, have room for growth on that. I want to introduce a second dimension into this. And that's equity. I know that's very, very important in your policies in Delaware. In some countries, social background has a big impact on the success of students. And what's interesting, in other countries, that's not the case. There are, in fact, education systems that have become very, very good in leveraging the talent of students from all backgrounds. Everybody wants to be there, but performance is very good, and there are no social disparities. Nobody wants to be there, but performance is poor, and there are large social disparities. 
And then you can think about, you know, is it better to do well on average at the price of inequalities? Or do you want to focus on equity and accept mediocrity? And if you look at, for example, Florida and Massachusetts, that's what you might think. Now you might think, well, either I am like Massachusetts, I'm doing well, but there's a large achievement gap, or I do like Florida, I try to sort of focus on equity and I lose out on the overall quality. But actually, when you look at the world around it, you can actually see it's actually quite possible to get to the green quadrant, to achieve well for students from all social classes. No? And many Asian systems are in there. No? They are particularly good in attracting the most talented teachers to the most challenging classrooms, getting the best principals for the toughest schools, having children from all classes actually to succeed. No? So actually, quality and equity is something that you can actually get right for every child. I want to put a last part into this equation. I don't have data for all countries, but in this money, the size of the dot tells you how much money you spend per student. The US comes out number three, no? fairly large bubble, a lot of money going into the system. If money would tell you everything about quality or equity, you'd find all the large bubbles at the top and all the small bubbles at the bottom. But that's actually not what you see. Volume of spending explains less than 15% of the performance variation across countries. How you spend your money is a lot more predictive. And I want to show you this on a second chart. No? This is basically, the red dot is basically spending per student that actually arrives in the classroom. And if you see the US was a big dot, a lot of money, but actually a, small, a low dot here in terms of money that actually arrives in the classroom. But there's another part to this. You can spend your money in very different ways. One way to spend money in obvious ways, actually to pay your teachers well. And that's what Korea does. Korea actually puts a lot of resources and you know, sort of attracting great people into the profession and um, also very differentiated way. There are many career paths, a lot of different ways how you can earn money as a teacher. Korea does a second thing. They say we want our students actually to have long hours in school. Nice to say, costs money. You can see how this bar rises. And then Korea does a third thing. They say we want our teachers not only to teach, but we want our teachers actually to be contributors to the profession. There's a lot of what we call non-teaching working time of teachers, working with parents, working for curriculum development, cleaning the classroom with your children. A lot of tasks that teachers actually have that are part of this pedagogical mission. Nice to say, but cost them more money. And you can see, actually, this is what they spend, and this is what they would be spending if this would be everything. But it isn't everything. There's one last point that is very important. That's class size. And actually, you can see that drives costs down in the case of Korea. They've traded off getting great people into teaching and actually pay for this with very large classes. You go to the next country on the list, sort of an average performer on PISA, Luxembourg, spends the same money as Korea. But in Luxembourg, you know, teachers and politicians like small classes. This is when the money has gone up, cost driven up by this. But even Luxembourg can spend its money only once. No? And that means, actually, the price for this has been, you know, little instruction time, teacher salaries, so so, and teachers have no time to do anything else except teaching. And you can go to the end of the list. You look at Finland or the United States. And you see, you know, Finland is a very different culture than Korea. In the north of Europe, Korea, the other side of the world. But they actually spend their money in very similar ways. And you can look at the United States. It's a lot more like Luxembourg. And you can make that comparison a lot more systematic and sophisticated, and you will actually see that high-performing education systems tend to prioritize the quality of teaching and quality of teachers over the size of classes. I was on Monday in Singapore. It's a great example how a system actually, you know, tries spending about half of what Delaware spends per student, but spending the money on the instructional environment in a very large classroom setting. Have a look at how this works there. So we look at technology very meaningfully and we see how can we leverage this technology to make a, a, a very significant impact in the classroom instruction. I'll give you an example. In a classroom of 40, it is really impossible to get 40 students to ask 40 questions at one go. When we use the 
instant messaging tool. We opened 40 windows to 40 kids. They could ask 40 questions at the same time and the teacher could see their thinking on, uh, on the technology tool that they use. And kids get more excited because they are using the tools that they are very, very good in using not just the permission communication technology tools. And I see them teaching the more senior teachers how to use those tools effectively. It's about instructional environment, not class size. Coming back to this, what's also really interesting is that this hasn't been a static picture. We've actually seen a lot of changes, and I want to show you some of them. Huh? Starting with the United States. This is where the United States was in the year 2003. This is where it is now. It is not that the United States has stood still. Actually, the United States has been quite successful in closing some of the social gaps, you know, moving from the red area to the yellow area. But in fact, if you move horizontal, what it actually means, while the US has been good at helping disadvantaged children, it has paid for that with performance losses among the sort of middle class children. There are better ways of getting there. If you look, for example, to Shanghai, no? you would find it there, now it's on the next screen. No? They continue to raise performance from very high levels. Or Singapore, no? moving from good to great as well. But you can even see that at the bottom, and you look at Turkey, where Turkey is here now, and where they were. No? Raising performance, reducing disparities. Germany, no? moving rightwards, also liberal upwards, raising performance, improving equity. Or you look at Italy, no? moving upwards, rightwards. Poland, very, very impressive performance gains. No? Portu Portugal, no? moving upwards. A bit to the left side, opening up disparities, but lots of children are better educated now than they were in the past. Enormous changes that we have seen. In fact, from 65 countries for which we have data, we have seen improvement, sort of significant improvements over the last decade. There is actually a lot happening in the field of education. I want to talk about you know, social class. One of the things that we see, I know that a lot of people say, well, the United States is a lot more diverse, has a lot of social challenges, but one of the things that we see is that the country where you are educated matters a lot more, or the school where you are educated, than the social class you come from. Let me show you something. This is basically looking at performance by decile of student group. You know, here you see the Mexican, these are the poor Mexicans, these are the ones from rich families, and you can see no, like children from rich families do better than children from poor families. No? And there's nothing wrong with the Mexicans. You can see that actually in every other country. But once you do that across countries, you suddenly see, you know, disadvantaged children. These are the children with the same background in every country. No? They, we know that they have ch parents who have not completed high school. We know that they come from poor families. Poverty, exactly the same. And you can see how different their performance no? You can see that at the top end, too. You can see, for example, the children of room cleaners in Shanghai outperform the children of professionals in many countries. No? And this tells us, actually, that social background isn't destiny. No? You can actually achieve a lot with those children. Those children from the most disadvantaged countries can achieve world-class standards. No? And that is a very, very important finding that we actually see a lot of diversity on that across countries. We also see that poor performance isn't just about poor kids in poor neighborhoods. It's actually in many happening in many classrooms. One thing that about the United States, it often gets a bit lost in the discussion, is that most of the performance variation doesn't lie between states. It doesn't lie even between schools. It lies within schools. There's a lot of underperformance in even high-performing or moderately performing schools. We can actually measure that too. And that gets me to the issue on the top performing students. When you look at the share of students who are doing really, really well by international standards, this is the world elite. And frankly, when you look at employment growth in the last decade, this is the only area we are seeing job growth in, in the industrialized world. Top end of the performance distribution. And you can see actually in Shanghai, you have every second child being at the elite internationally. The labor market isn't using their potential. That's another story, but they're doing really well. Massachusetts, also really, really good. Connecticut, also quite good on that. But you get to Florida, and you can see it's less than one in 10 students who has the potential to become sort of a contributor to the knowledge economy. Huge variability in academic excellence. And that, I think, is a big challenge as well. Equity, but equity and excellence are not mutually exclusive policy objectives. You can see countries like Shanghai 
or systems like Shanghai or Singapore or many have actually get this uh, right together. And those systems are of a similar size than Delaware. I think one of the great advantages you have is that you do have the size of an education system that can be one of the fast movers. You have a limited number of people. You need to get together and make things happen. So what are the kind of levers behind success? What have we learned? And I want to order them by their relative impact on success, on outcomes but also keep in mind the kind of political and economic cost of change. We, we can't sort of ignore that part. You want to focus on things that are easy to do and very important, that's obvious. You don't want to spend money on things that are really hard to do and not so important, but you know, you saw the issue on classes. Unfortunately, in education, we are not very, very good to ignore that part. You want to do some of the things that are really important but hard to do, and I think that's really, if you want to move your, education system to the kind of 21st century kind of paradigms, you have to invest in that. And then you can pick up some low-hanging fruits, things that are easy to do, but maybe not that important. No? Let me just sort of point out a few things where we have really some good data on that. No? The first thing that actually I want to highlight here is that one thing that you can see across the world in high-performing system is that commitment to universal achievement, high performance. And that is mirrored in the understanding that every child can achieve. And you can see that even in the view through which children see education. That's absolutely fascinating. You know, we ask children a simple question. What do you believe will make you successful in mathematics? And then you can get many students in North America, but also in Europe, who tell you, well, success in mathematics is about talent. You know, if I'm born as a genius, I'm going to study mathematics, and if not, I'm going to do something else. And if you ask the same question to students in Finland or students in East Asia, they consistently tell you, you know, it's about effort and hard work. If I really try hard, I trust my teachers are going to help me, and I'm going to be successful. And this tells you a lot about the education system. In one way, you know, education is seen as, you know, sorting people. It's nothing you can really do. Whatever you do is not going to change the world. In the other case, children own their success. The education system has told them, you know, we have the same expectation for you, whatever background you come from, and we're going to get you to the same point, but you are the differentiator in this. We have universal education standards, high degree of personalization. We don't have much tracking in those systems, and we have very, very great clarity on who is responsible for ensuring student success and to whom. And this is not a story of teachers uh, and, 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 and school leaders alone. This is a story of students. It's a story of parents. It's a story of, you know, the business sector. Everyone is, this is everybody's business. I want to show you just one piece of data on that. This is basically showing an index of self-efficacy. The way, the extent to which students see themselves as owners of their success and then the mathematics performance. And you can see within countries, those things are strongly related, but even across countries. And you can see, again, Shanghai comes out on top on both dimensions. Those kids are not only doing really well, but they know that success depends on nothing more than on themselves. You can look at this the other, and the US comes not badly, but it's sort of a middle range performer among this group of middle countries there. You can look at this the other way around, and I'll show you here the contrast between France and Shanghai. Who do students blame when they are not successful? And you can actually see this is the average. These are the Chinese, and these are the French. You look at this, and you can see French kids blame anybody except themselves for failing. <laughs> right? And you look at the Chinese, some do, but actually most Chinese, despite the fact that the courses is a lot harder, now this, the bar is set much higher in China than in France, you can see fewer students actually seeing that as a cause for their failure. This is what I'm talking about. In the US, it's somewhere in the middle between those things. No? Very, very important ingredient of success. Parents, actually, you know that. You know, when you have higher expectations as a parent, your children do better in school. That's well established. But you can even see from our parent survey that students, their parents invest more in education in terms of expectations. They enjoy learning more. Disciplinary climate is higher. Many of those school ingredients are actually related to parents. The fact that parents ask their children daily, how was school? Showing a minimum level of interest. This is not about your academic degree. This is not about three hours of homework with the children. The fact that parents were involved 
actually predicts more than the social context of the family. And this doesn't come from nowhere. If you actually look to some of the Asian countries, again, go back to China. You know, every teacher would call every parent twice per week about schooling. And this is not a sort of super teacher that does this. This is part of the working day of teachers. This is the way they actually structure their responsibilities. Very important. Gateways instructional systems, I think it's of critical importance. Not much attention is paid to this typically in the United States at the level of the education systems. But what we see is that high-performing systems have not only clear ambitious goals, but they are also very systematic in how they translate those standards in our teaching practices, in curricula, in learning materials. There is a very well articulated delivery chain through how those ideas, think about the common core, it's a great gold standard, but how do you actually make it happen in the classroom? And that's actually, I put it very much to the right because those things are not rocket science. They're actually quite well articulated, easy to do. We also see a high level of metacognitive content. It's a bit complex to explain, but it's basically about having students not only learn the facts, but actually having them understand what's underlying. You know, mathematics is not about theorems and formulas and equations. It's about a language with which you can understand structure and, 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 and develop the world. Very, very important part, this kind of instructional system. I put it up very much, right where it's things actually you could be doing in Delaware quickly, but you need to do that at the level of the system. Now to the thing that actually matters probably after the expectations, most, that's capacity at the point of delivery, and I put it very much to the left because that's actually the long haul, the hard thing, how to develop capacity at the point of delivery. We see that high-performing systems are very good in attracting great people into teaching. They invest a lot in their development, not necessarily in initial teacher training. No? A lot happens actually once people have entered the workforce. There's a lot of investment in there and providing people with the kind of environment and work organization in which they can grow professionally. This is about career paths, career diversity, career differentiation, giving people opportunities to actually grow, and tying those opportunities to the areas in which they use this. Instructional leadership, having principals who are not managers of a school building, but who are actually building the kind of human capital that you need at the school to actually make things happen keeping teaching attractive. We actually have a lot of data on that. That shows, you know, salaries are part of the equation, but actually not the most important part. These things are about pu public recognition. It's about, you know, creating awareness of what, it, what the teachers, uh, what is, is about system-wide career development. I had a short video, but I, I will skip that because of time. I want to briefly touch on incentive structures and accountability. I put it very much to the right as well, because actually, it's quite easy to do, but there are many dimensions to this. In the United States, accountability is often about teachers and schools. I think that's a great strength of the US system. You're very much advanced in school-based accountability, much more than many other countries. But the important part is, how do you get the incentives right for students? What I can tell you is that every high-performing education system at the top end has a high-stakes exit examination. Every student, every teacher, every principal, Every parent knows what it matters, what, what, what is important in education, and invests the effort to get there. You have the common core standards, but you are very, very clear what it means at the level of individual students. The stakes are primarily at the level of the students. And there's also a lot of incentives for actually students to take on tough courses. Now, if you just offer students a lot of choice, the risk is that students just choose the things that are easy, not the things that are really important for the long-term future. And the dilemma is, if you think about science and engineering, you, know, you don't become an engineer at age 40. There's a long delivery chain. If you've lost the mathematics in the early years of schooling, you're never going to make it back. So what you have in those systems is those kind of incentive structures that get people to the water of the things that matters for them. For teachers, you know, the hard part of accountability is not how you control the system, but how you stimulate innovation, improvement. How do you encourage teachers not only to improve their own performance, but also the performance of their colleagues? Very many interesting examples in the best performing education systems. How you balance vertical accountability and lateral accountability. You know, moving information upwards, but also sharing best practice. You know, spreading innovation throughout the system. It's very easy in an education system to get good practice into a classroom. You know, just 
tell people what to do. Very, very hard to get good practice out of the system, out of the classroom, into the education system. We have some really, really good examples. And one of the lessons that we have actually learned, the more responsibility you have at the front line, in the school, at the local districts, the stronger the education system needs to be around. This is not in contradiction to local control. In fact, local control and this kind of collaborative culture, they're actually even conditioning their success. And that brings me, oh no, I have sort of just a couple of data points on this. On the vertical axis, you see performance of the system. And on the horizontal axis, you see the degree of control that schools have over their own affairs. And this is probably the most surprising picture for you. You imagine the United States to be the model of local control. No? But in fact, you look at this through the lens of teachers and school principals, and you're pretty much on the left side of this. No? This is not the way the world looks when you look at this from through the eyes of schools. If you are you know, in the United Kingdom, very similar in the layout of the US education system, you know, here or in Japan, you know, Schools have to figure out, you know, actually, whom do I hire? Now, how do I pay my people? How do I structure the careers? There's a lot more responsibility at the point of delivery in many systems. And you can see, actually, the relationship is not that strong, but you can see there's a tendency. Hong Kong, another great example. There's a tendency for high-performing education systems to devolve a lot of responsibility, not just to the local districts, but actually to the front line of delivery. It's the combination of professional autonomy and the collaborative culture. And that's actually interesting to see in conjunction. A couple of data points on this. If you have no standardized mathematics policy, and that's basically our term for something like the common core. If you have no shared vision of what good performance is in the system, you actually see that the more autonomous schools do worse than the less autonomous schools. So suddenly it seems school autonomy is a bad thing. But if you do have this common vision of what high performance is about, you see how school autonomy works in your favor. And that tells us it's not about you know, local control, central control. It's about the combination of a collaborative culture, a shared notion of what good performance is, and local control. There's another dimension to this. If school autonomy means you know, the principal or the superintendent decides everything, and the people at the front line are not involved, teachers do not participate in management, school autonomy works against you. If you do have a system in which actually you have, we call this distributed leadership, but the essence is very, it's very simple. It's basically about you know, bringing people into the kind of decision-making processes. Leaders are about you know, involving teachers. It's about, you can actually say, see how school autonomy becomes your friend. Again, you know, it's a combination of local discretion and, again, a distributed version. And here's something a bit more controversial, probably less in the US than in most other countries. It's about whether you should make data transparent. No. You do that, but many other countries are shying away from this. But we actually have, really, if you have a system with very limited transparency, you can actually see how school autonomy works against you. If you do have a system where there is clarity and transparency, over school results, you can see how school autonomy becomes a predictor for success. So that's really sort of my, my that's just two parts in here. One is it's a combination of autonomy and a collaborative culture with transparency, with distributed leadership, and with a shared understanding of what good performance is, which you get through the common core. And at the very same time, it is also about you know, the more responsibility you have at the front line the stronger the education system around it really needs to be. And I just want to sort of show you one element of this. You know, this is not about testing. When I talk about accountability, testing is an important element of this, but there are many, many more elements. Here are some dimensions of quality assurance for which we have measures. Now, there are many more that we can't really quantify. This is the average, and this is Singapore. So what you see in Singapore, you know, Every school implements, not only sort of, there is not only a standard curriculum, every school actually tries to make that happen. If you look at the United States, actually, you, you have a state or local cu uh, curriculum, but often many schools tell us, well, you know, we don't do that for reasons we, we don't know, but I think very important that it's about implementation. 
Also, schools generally talk to people outside their own sphere, no? involving experts on improvement. Every school mentors people who are coming into the profession. No? Every school feels that responsibility. They are newcomers. We've got to invest in them. No? Every school, or most schools, actually seek written feedback from the stakeholders. Now, some people say, you know, Singapore is an autocratic system, you know, it's very easy to run. Actually, no, they listen very, very carefully to every student, to every teacher, and they collect systematic data from those people. Now, external evaluation, a matter of course, internal evaluation, happening in every school, data recording, and so on. So you can see really there's an integrated mechanism of quality assurance that actually helps the system to improve. I just wanted to highlight one aspect here, the kind of professional learning communities. I know that Delaware is working on that as well, but Singapore has actually taken that very, very far. Have a look at how this works in their schools. To do that, really we get teachers to work together, to collaborate, and uh, to look at each other's uh, practice in a classroom. I think that is essential and really very critical, because the good teaching practices should not reside within the four walls and be kept to one teacher. And I think there is a lot of sharing that uh, we can uh, have in, in, in this school. What you want to do right now is, okay, think of the Socratic questions, okay? What do I want to uh, use to further define, clarify? Now, okay, I will go on the internet, I will find any sort of evidence that uh, will help support this statement or I can all refute this professional learning community in schools was started basically to ensure that teachers had a platform to develop their teaching practices. Our main focus actually is to make sure that students learn best and uh, in order to do that we have to collaborate. We exchange ideas, uh, we, we, we try out, we test uh, and eventually we check for results and the intention really is to share ideas to make it better for the students. And you know, this is not special about Singapore. You can see that in many, the Asian culture is very, very strong on this. No? In Japan, they do that by moving teachers around every three years. You know, every three years you work in a new school. In China, you know, the way you become popular as a teacher, famous, move up in your career, is by having other people use your ideas. You know, the, what the government has done is something very simple. They created a platform where everybody shares their lesson plans. You know, every teacher uploads their own lesson plan if they want to. And the more other teachers actually start to use your lesson plans, improve on that, comment on that, the more popular you become, the more likely you're going to be to advance in your career. Again, it's like on, you know, we know these things from eBay, from Amazon, it works everywhere, except not in the schools. No? But they're sort of very, very strong in building on the ideas of their own people. No? Very strong in their collaborative culture. The last point, I know I'm running out of time, I want to do a highlight, which I think is also very important, and this is not about how much you spend, but how well you align the resources with the challenges, and how the spending choices prioritize high quality over things like class size. I want to just show you a couple of data points which I think are quite instructive. Here I show you not how much countries spend on the horizontal axis, but how equitably they spend. Now, if you are at the zero line, you spend as much of your high quality teachers. This is, not, this is not volume, this is quality of teachers. No? If you're at the zero line, sort of you're neutral. If you're on the right side, you're actually attracting more qualified teachers into the more disadvantaged schools. If you're on the left side, and the US is very much on the left side, it are more, most countries, no? you actually penalize disadvantaged children twice. They come from a disadvantaged background, and they may get more resources, but they do not have access to the better resources. No? And you can see, there is a relationship. It is not only that more equitable investment yields more equitable outcomes. That's what you would expect. No. It is that more equitable investment yields better outcomes. Equitable investment, it's also an efficient way of spending money. If you can, again, you take Shanghai as an example. One thing they do very systematically, you know, if you're a vice principal in a high-performing school in Shanghai and you want to become principal, the education system tells you, you know, well, you can do that, but first help us turn around one of the lowest performing schools. And the same for the teachers. And you think about, oh, they take the best people out of the great schools, putting them in a poor school. What's happening with the great school? But actually, there's no loss in performance. Take out a few people, a few teachers with you, but you can actually change the world in a low performing school in two years' time. That's sort of the time frame <coughs> they use for that. And you can see that in another way as well. You can see 
Disadvantaged schools in the United States have a lot more difficulties with teacher, school, teacher shortage than privileged schools. It's true for most countries, but it's really a major issue, I think, to, to spend money where it can make most of a difference. The last resource, I know that it's an issue in Delaware. In many countries as well, as you know, schooling doesn't start when people come into school, but early childhood education is very important too. One of the things we measured is, you know, we asked the 15-year-olds in our test, actually, about the intensity and intent, uh, incident of their participation in early childhood learning. I don't have any measure of quality, unfortunately. This is just, you know, whether they did this over a sustained period of time. And you can see at age 15, even after controlling for social background, that's the green bar, you have an average of 40 points left. That is, you are more a year ahead at age 15 if you have taken part in early childhood education. The bars are of different lengths, you know, that's hard to explain. That might be an issue of quality. We don't know, but on average, there's a lot you can. Very, very last point, very briefly, and I'm not going to show the detail on this, it's about coherence. It's about aligning what you do across all aspects of the system. It's about getting the delivery trajectory mapped out over time. Some things you can do in the short term, in the medium term, in the long term. And high performing systems are very, very good in having this long term vision. It's about consistency of implementation, moving from intended policies to implemented to achieved policies. And finally, about you know, getting the people at the front line on board. You, know, you can't push reforms on people at the front line. You need to actually make them part of this reform implementation process. It's the only way how you get really high levels of fidelity. At least that's the lesson that we le learn from high performing education system. I'll leave you with this. I mean, the encouraging part is actually Delaware has seen a lot of improvement, but there's a lot of further change that you can actually leverage in relatively short periods of history. You know? The kind of trajectories that I showed you here, I'm talking about the time since the year 2000. A lot of change in a lot of countries in very short time period. Thank you very much. <coughs>